I'm sure that you know what a camera sensor is and that you've at least heard of the different sensor sizes such as micro four thirds, full frame, APS-C, APS-H, stuff like that. And you might even know how these affect zoom range or pixel size, but do you know why? Or do you know why sensors affect depth of field? Well, today I'm going to talk about all that. Let's get to it. Today is about sensors. Without them, I wouldn't be able to film this video. You wouldn't be able to take pictures on your iPhone and the world just wouldn't go around. So to fully understand sensors and how they work and what they affect, we need to start at the very beginning, which is what is a pixel? Now you might say, well, I know what a pixel is. It's a little tiny square of color in an image. And you're not wrong, but where does that pixel come from, I ask you? Well, the answer is sensors, yes, like the sensor in your camera, is actually divided up into a minuscule little grid that you can't even see. And this grid is the pixel. Each pixel is one little square in the grid and collects its own light. It's so small there are millions of pixels on this sensor because a megapixel is how many million pixels are in your image. So if you have a 43 megapixel sensor, that's 43 million pixels on the individual sensor, which is only like that tall, depending on the size, of course. And so these tiny squares act as buckets or pails to collect light information, the electrons that hit them, and turn it into a signal that the camera can process and how these pixels capture light gets super nerdy and even I don't understand it fully. So I won't get into that, but it's pretty amazing all the same. And a good place to start learning about how pixels interpret light is color depth, which we will talk about soon. Now this is about to get super geeky and nerdy and I'm actually gonna use math. I know math is awful, not really in my opinion, but don't worry because after this it gets a lot simpler. So the sensor size itself is easy. You have full frame, APS-C, micro four thirds, as I mentioned, and the size of the sensor is self-explanatory. If you are familiar with them, you know that micro four thirds is smaller. APS-C is kind of a middle ground. Full frame is the typical standard when it came to film. That's why it's called full frame. And then you can go past that into medium format. However, we will just be focusing in this video on APS-C in full frame so that we can keep things nice and simple. Now on to megapixels. As I explained, these are how many million pixels are in your image and therefore how many pixels are on your sensor. So 24 megapixels is on an APS-C or a full frame means that there are 24 million pixels on your image sensor and then in your image, regardless of the sensor size. And in standard 3-2 aspect ratio, that's 6,000 pixels wide and 4,000 pixels tall, and you multiply those two numbers together, you get 24 million. Now, sensor size as it relates to megapixels is where we get sensor pixel area from. Now, at first, this won't make any sense to you. However, I'm about to explain it, don't worry. And this is what plays a factor in digital noise and dynamic range between different sensor sizes. So the sensor pixel area is just the ratio of the size of pixels on one sensor compared to another. Meaning to get sensor pixel area, we need to calculate the size of pixel on one sensor to the, and the size of pixel on another sensor. And yes, pixels have different sizes. Think about it. You might have a really old full frame digital camera that is eight megapixels. Now that's really low resolution, but it's not that hard to fit eight megapixels on a nice big 35 millimeter sensor as it is compared to trying to fit 24 million pixels on a much smaller APS-C sensor. And more pixels on a smaller sensor just means that those pixels themselves have to be smaller to fit on the smaller surface. And likewise, if you have a 24 megapixel full frame sensor and a 24 megapixel APS-C sensor, to fit the same number of pixels on the two different sensors, the pixels on the smaller sensor have to be smaller. So before we calculate the size of pixel, just keep in mind that it will be a rough estimate of pixel pitch. Pixel pitch is the width of a pixel. However, it's only a rough estimate because on a sensor, you can have imperfections in the grid with the pixels themselves. You can have tiny, tiny minuscule gaps in between, and sometimes not even the pixels themselves are exactly the same size, but you don't notice it in the image. So again, it's just a rough estimate. 
But to roughly calculate the size of pixel on a sensor, it goes like this. Width of the sensor in millimeters divided by the number of pixels in that width. Yeah, it's that easy. W slash P, width divided by pixels. So if we fill that in for a full frame 35 millimeter sensor, or some full frame sensors are just above that at 36 millimeters, which makes the math easier. So that's what I will be using then we can see that with a 24 megapixel full frame 36 millimeter sensor, which is 6,000 pixels across, and that comes out to be 0.006 millimeters. Now this is not the area of a pixel, it is just the width of a pixel or the pixel pitch. So if we want to calculate the actual area of a pixel, we just need to, well, multiply that number by itself because it's a square and a square is the same length across as it is tall and to find the area of a rectangle we just multiply the width by the height so anyway 0.006 millimeters times 0.006 millimeters comes out to be 0.036 millimeters and of course that's square millimeters so the rough pixel pitch of a full frame 24 megapixel sensor is 0.006 millimeters and the pixel area of such a sensor is roughly 0.036 millimeters squared. But they aren't usually expressed in millimeters because then you add all these zeros. So they're usually expressed in microns, which is one one thousandth of a millimeter and is usually expressed by the Greek letter mu followed by the letter m. And again, that just reduces a bunch of zeros and makes the math way easier. So again, that pixel pitch would then be six microns. Okay, now we are on to crop factor. I promise I will get to that dynamic range and ISO performance and everything like that soon. But crop factor is a nice, simple, easy, relatively concept to understand. Now the chances are you know what crop factor is and how it relates to zoom, but you might not know how it affects aperture or even that it does at all. And you might not know where we get crop factor from. So anyway, let's just get on with it. So let's go back to good old APS-C and full frame sensor sizes. Full frame is the standard, so it has a crop factor of one, or times one. But as you know, anything times one is itself. So you don't have a crop factor effectively for full frame. And APS-C has a crop factor of 1.5, or if you're on Canon, 1.6, but doesn't matter. We're gonna use 1.5 for now. Or you can fill in the math with 1.6. And don't forget, this math works for any sensor size's crop factor. For example, the standard medium format has a crop factor of 0.72 because it's bigger than a full frame. And micro four thirds is a crop factor of times two. Now the math for how it affects zoom and aperture is easy, but keep in mind, you don't apply the crop factor to the aperture for exposure. Aperture is standardized around exposure. You only apply it to the aperture to calculate the depth of field. So if you have an exposure of 1 one hundredth of a second, ISO 100, aperture f2.8 on a full frame, and an exposure of 1 one hundredth, aperture f2.8, ISO 100 on an APS-C, you will see the same exposure, the same brightness level. However, you will see different background blur and a narrower field of view on the APS-C. So for calculating the full frame equivalence for that field of view or the focal range and the depth of field or the aperture on your specific sensor size as it relates to full frame, you just multiply the value by 1.5 times. So if we have 50 millimeters f2.8 on an APS-C and we want to know what it will look like on a full frame camera, then we multiply that 50 millimeters and that f2.8 by 1.5 times each and we end up with 75 millimeters at 4.2. But remember the aperture is only affecting depth of field and hopefully that made sense. But if not, let's use another example. Let's say that you want an image to look like a 50 millimeters F 2.8 on a full frame and you have an APS-C camera. You just need to divide those full frame values by 1.5 to get the APS-C equivalent. So, Dividing 50 millimeters by f1.5, we get 33.33333333333333 millimeters. You get the idea, it goes on forever. And an aperture of f1.8666666666, you get the idea. But 
Again, you would need to make the shutter speed faster to get a darker image of the same exposure because that aperture only affects depth of field and as you open it up, it changes the exposure of the image. So why is there a crop factor? Well, let's start with what determines a crop factor. Why do we have that 1.5 times for APS-C? Well, a full frame sensor is typically 35 or 36, and again, it's easier, so that's what I'm gonna use, 36 by 24 millimeters. And APS-C also varies, but is generally about 22.2 by 14.8 millimeters. Now, if we calculate the diagonal of these rectangles using the standard, the Pythagorean theorem, D equals the square root of W to the second power plus L also to the second power, where D is the diagonal, W is the width, and L is the length. Doing the math, that becomes, and don't mind me while I read this off of my script here, the square root of 22.2 to the second power plus 14.8 to the second power for APSC, and blah blah blah, square root of the two, you get the idea. So in the end, the full frame diagonal is 43.27 millimeters, and the APS-C diagonal is 26.68 millimeters. Dividing the full frame diagonal by the APS-C diagonal, we get roughly 1.508 hence the 1.5. And the same equations work with any sensor size. Also, the reason we use the diagonal of the sensor and not the width or the length is because a lens projects a circle of light. And the diagonal of the sensor is the only part of the sensor in either diagonal direction, taking up the full width of that circle of light. If we try using the width or the height, we get 1.62626262626262, etc, etc, for both width and height. So the reason why crop factor exists, well, think about it. If you put an APS-C lens on a full frame sensor, what happens? Well, the APS-C lens is designed to project a circle of light that is the width of the diagonal of the APS-C sensor, but that diagonal is smaller than the full frame sensor. So that means that the image circle, which is what the circle of light is called, is going to be narrower than the diagonal of the sensor on the full frame camera, and therefore you will just see a partial circle image and the full sensor won't be receiving light. And think about it the other way. If you put a full frame lens on an APS-C sensor, then that image circle is bigger than is what is strictly needed, so the APS-C sensor doesn't take up the full image circle. Now, what about when you put an APS-C lens on an APS-C sensor? Well, there's still a crop factor here, even though the image circle is the correct size. Technically, you wouldn't need a crop factor. You could just say that this 50 millimeters um, for APS-C was the 50 millimeters for APS-C, but having a crop factor regardless just makes it all easier because you're standardized around one standard. Now we are on to ISO and we are finally talking about why sensor size and pixel size affects digital noise and dynamic range and all that. So let's get to it. So you'll often hear that full frame cameras or better yet medium format cameras are better performing in low light. And this is usually very true, but why is that? Remember sensor pixel area and how it's the ratio between the size of a pixel on one sensor compared to another? Well, we never actually calculated this, did we? But let's go back to that pixel size. You should remember that we compared a 24 megapixel APS-C camera to a 24 megapixel full frame camera and stated that because they had the same number of pixels, but the sen one of the sensors is smaller, that the pixels on that smaller sensor must also be smaller. So with that in mind, let's think about the fact that the bigger the pixel, the more light they can gather, and therefore the more information they have. Things starting to click yet? Therefore, the bigger the pixel, the more information you're receiving in that light, and the better the ISO performance, because digital noise is just a lack of information. So this is the place where sensor pixel area comes in handy. Remember, this is the ratio of the size of one pixel on one sensor to the size of another pixel on another sensor. And to calculate this, because we never did, well, it's easy. Let's go back to those microns. We already know that a full frame 24 megapixel camera has a six micron pixel picture, and we do the same thing for a 24 megapixel APS-C camera, and we find out that it has a pixel picture 
of 3.7 micron. For the ratio between those two numbers, we need the area of the pixels. So we just square them. So for the full frame, this comes out to be 36 microns. And for the APS-C, this comes out to be 13.65 micron. To calculate the difference in size, we subtract that APS-C number from the full frame number, which gives us 22.35, and divide the 22.35 by the original APS-C number which gives us 22.35 divided by 13.65. And that comes out to be 1.637 or rounding 1.64. And that means that the pixels on the full frame sensor are 164% bigger. Now, does that mean that the ISO performance on the full frame sensor will be 164% better? Well, no. For one thing, you can't really measure the performance of digital noise. More than just the size of the pixel affects ISO performance. One of these major factors is processing power of the camera. As time has gone on, cameras and their processing power have just gotten better and better, exponentially so. So if you take, say, an 8 megapixel full frame camera from 13 years ago, and you compare it to a modern day 24 megapixel micro four thirds camera, even though the pixels on that Micro Four Thirds camera are so, so much smaller, you're gonna get better ISO performance on that camera because back then when we were pretty much just starting to go digital, the processing power and the power to refine that information and capture that detail in the image just wasn't there. So now we are almost onto dynamic range, but we need to talk about signal to noise ratio first. Now, I'm not going to go super, super in depth here. If you want a very nerdy explanation of dynamic range, head over to my video I did on that previously, where we talk about dynamic range and signal to noise ratio. But let me define them and give you some explanation anyway. Signal in signal to noise ratio, or SN for short, refers to the level of light hitting the pixel. A strong signal is a bright light signal, and a weak signal is dark. And if you have a high signal to noise ratio, you get less noise. If you have a low signal to noise ratio, you get more noise. And all of this means that the brighter the light, the less noise you're gonna have. And the darker the light, the more noise you're gonna have. You might have seen this yourself when trying to recover the detail in the shadows and highlights of one of your images. When you try to recover the shadows, there's a lot of noise there, right? But then when you go to try to recover the highlights, while the full detail and information might not be there, you're not gonna see any noise. Now we are on to dynamic range itself. Again, check that video in the cards above for a full explanation. However, dynamic range is defined as the difference between the strongest signal and the weakest signal. And the signals again are referring to the brightness of light in your image. And because a brighter light means higher signal and more information and less distortion, especially at a lower ISO value, this means you're going to get more dynamic range. This means that less scene light, or in other words, a dim scene that you are trying to capture and a high ISO value combined is going to give you less dynamic range than a lower ISO value and more light actually hitting the sensor. And going back to those pixel sizes, bigger pixels can capture more light and more information, which does not mean that the image will be brighter on the full frame, at least noticeably so, but that the pixels are able to capture more information and send that information to the camera processor to refine. Also regarding sensors and image quality is bit depth and color depth. Now we have made a couple videos about bit depth and color depth and chroma subsampling, and you can see the latest one in the cards above, but all the same, I will talk about it briefly here. After the exposure time of a camera is up, in other words, after you've pressed that button and the shutter has clicked, the sensor has that light information, but it needs to send it to the processor somehow. It does this by converting it into binary code which you may know as the common computing language, which uses ones and zeros. These ones and zeros are bits, and these bits are what makes up the shade of color as well as the luminance of the individual pixel. So if you have a one bit image, you can only have two options, black or white, also known as one or zero. A two bit system can have four combinations, zero, 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 one, one, zero, or one, one. And these would be black, dark gray, medium gray, white. A three bit image has eight. Don't mind me while I read them off. Zero, 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 one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, zero, one, one, zero, zero, one, 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 zero, one, and one, one, one. So these bits in bit depth 
are what capture the shade of luminance in the pixels. Not the color, we're about to get to that though. And an 8-bit image has 256 shades of white to black. A 14-bit photo, which is not uncommon, can have 16,384 shades from white to black. To calculate how many possibilities there are based on the number of these bits, is you take 2 and you just raise it to the power of the number of bits. So in a 3-bit image, you have those 3 bits for example, 000 or 010, you get the idea. And you just raise 2 to the third power, which gives us 8. If we raise 2 to the eighth power, we get 256. Now, bit depth and color depth are different because bit depth is the number of shades from white to black a camera can capture, or the different shades that an individual pixel can capture, but color depth is the number of shades the whole sensor is capable of capturing. To do this, we just raise the different sh number of shades to the third power. So for example, with that 3-bit image, we had 8 different combinations, 8 different shades that we could capture. We raise that to the third power, we get 512 different shades of color that that camera can capture. Assuming it's not a black and white camera, of course. Raising 256 to the third power means that the color depth of a camera with a bit depth of 8 can capture 6,677,216 different shades of color. Why 3? That's because that's the number of colors your camera can actually capture. It then just morphs those colors that it receives into all the other colors you see. So this is where we talk about Bayer filters. Bayer filters are the most common type of color filter that is placed over your sensor to interpret color. The Bayer filter can only see the three primary digital colors, which is red, green, and blue, RGB. Which is why it's important you have lots and lots of shades of each. But the Bayer filter can interpret any shade of these colors. The sensor can only interpret the luminance of the light hitting it. The Bayer filter is what filters out the different colors. So think of it like this. You have those pixels that are wells, right? Well, imagine that this time that they're buckets, which I think is an analogy I actually referred to earlier. But imagine you want to fill these buckets up with a bunch of different colors of water or paint, but your paint is all mixed up. Well, of course this isn't possible, but imagine if you placed a filter over each one of the buckets that would only accept the color of paint you wanted in that bucket. That's actually red, green, and blue paint mixed together over the buckets, and one bucket gets green, one bucket gets red, and one bucket gets blue. Well, this is actually what's happening with the bear filter. The bear filter is actually blocking out light that isn't of the color that the pixel is assigned to. So each pixel, again, can only capture one color of light. And this is where I could get into color resolution, but that's even more complicated than is necessary today and would be too much detail. The bear filter is organized 50% green, 25% blue, 25% red. This is because our eyes as humans interpret green as 200% brighter than the other colors. So we need 200% more of it in our cameras to make the image look realistic. So as I said, red light passes through the, the filter and hits the red pixels. Green light passes through the green filter and hits the green pixels. You get the gist. And using all this information and a series of algorithms and interpolations, the sensor and the processor can interpret these colors into an image. If you want to see another topic covered in a nerdy fashion such as this, drop a comment down below. Thank you for watching. So now no whying. Now, megapixels as So um the sensor pixel area. So pixel sensor area is just this pixel pitch is the width of a pit pixel pitch it after the after the exposure time color filter that is placed over your over your, well, the, of course, so you poured the paint that had, that's mixed together 